You know, running a small business isn't easy. It has its pain points, but Alibaba.com helped ease them. Anything from anywhere in the world with Alibaba.com, the sourcing pros. Scrawny and just over five feet tall, Ma Yun was always outnumbered. When he applied for a job with KFC, there were 24 people in the room. He was the only person that went home without an offer. The rejections didn't stop there, but it helped Ma become the richest man in China with a net worth of over $38 billion. In 1964, Ma Yun was born in Hangzhou, China. His parents were professional Ping Tan performers. They raised Ma at a time when China was isolated from the West. Communist Party campaigns dominated daily life. After President Nixon visited Hangzhou, it became a tourist attraction. Ma saw this as an opportunity to practice his English. When he was 12, he woke up at 5 a.m. to walk or bike to the city's main hotel and gave free tours for English lessons. It was then that he was given the name Jack by a tourist. Despite his determination to learn a second language, he wasn't a great student. I failed a key primary school test two times. I failed the middle school test three times. I failed the college entrance exam two times. He especially struggled with math and scored one out of 120 points on his college entrance exam. I am not good at math, have never studied management, and still cannot read accounting reports. But he didn't let that stop him from dreaming about Harvard Business School. I applied for Harvard 10 times, got rejected 10 times, and I told myself that someday I should go teach there. Eventually he moved on and applied to Hangzhou Teachers Institute. At the time, it was considered the city's worst university. He failed the entrance exams twice. On his third try, he finally passed and pursued a bachelor's degree in English. When he graduated, the university's president stopped him at the gate and waved him over. He asked Jack to promise him that he'll stick with teaching for six years. Jack hesitated but agreed. Many opportunities came his way, but he kept his promise. It taught him how to be a good teacher and how to communicate with his students. After the six years passed, he wasn't sure what he wanted to do with his life. He applied to 30 different jobs and was rejected by all of them. When KFC came to China, 24 people went for the job. 23 people were accepted. I was the only guy who wasn't. The same thing happened when he tried to become a cop. All of the four or five applicants were hired except for him. Another time, he lost out on a job to his own blood. My cousin and I waited for two hours in a long queue to be the waiter for the four-star hotel in my city on a very hot day. My cousin's score was much lower than mine, but he was accepted and I was rejected. So he returned to his university and taught English and international trade. He only earned between 12 to $15 a month. In 1994, Jack took his first shot at being his own boss. He started his own translation company while continuing to teach. It took a year to develop, but it allowed him to work with some of the first US and foreign companies that did business in China. After learning about their success stories, he set an ambitious goal of changing China's corporate culture. In 1995, Jack traveled to the US for the first time as an interpreter for a joint venture project. While there, he tried to collect a debt on behalf of a friend from a businessman in California. The businessman refused to pay back the money and locked Jack in his house. At one point, he started playing with his handgun. It was obviously meant as a threat. A few days later, the businessman took Jack to Las Vegas for a showcase trip for Chinese businessmen. Jack was penniless, but he decided to try his luck at gambling. After all, what could he lose? Luck was on his side. He won $600 from playing the slot machines. He used the money to buy a plane ticket to Seattle and fled, leaving all of his belongings behind. It was a terrible experience. Every time I think of LA, I have a nightmare. In Seattle, he visited a friend and noticed a gray box with a screen on his desk. What the heck is this? He asked. Jack, it's not a bomb, his friend said. It's a computer. Just touch it and play it any way you want. It was then that Jack discovered the internet. He typed in beer and was shown a list of results. But when he typed in beer and China, there was nothing. At the time, Netscape just started and Yahoo barely launched. Very few people in the world understood the internet and fewer could see its potential. But Jack sensed a big opportunity and believed the internet was going to change the world. When he returned home, he started another company. I was 30 years old. I started a business without knowing anything about the computer business. My wife and I and a schoolmate. We had $1,000 to start the business. 
Together, they built a directory service for businesses in China called China Pages. It turned out to be a disaster. It ran on a dial-up connection and took three and a half hours to load half a page. The next few years remained a struggle. Jack tried to borrow $3,000 from a bank, but they rejected him. So he had to borrow from friends instead. Some of them were skeptical and said to each other, Jack is telling a lie because there is no such network called the internet. In 1996, Jack finally proved them wrong. That year, China was given access to the internet. He raised $60,000 from 18 friends and built an e-commerce website for small businesses. At the time, Americans focused on big businesses, but it didn't make sense for China since they had more small businesses. Jack called his website Alibaba, named after Alibaba, a poor carpenter who accidentally finds treasure in the tale 1001 Nights. We should help the small guys. We should not help small guys to reduce costs. Small businesses should learn how to make money. Early on, Jack faced many hurdles. Most of the small businesses were mom and pop shops who had no education beyond middle school. The internet was utterly foreign to them. So Jack sent people to knock on their doors and teach them how to set up connections and register on Alibaba. But they had trouble getting people to trust their service. China had no credit checking system and many businesses had no credit history. So Jack and his team built a trust system called TrustPass to encourage people to do business online. When they registered, they could pay Alibaba a small fee to hire a third party to verify their business licenses, physical addresses, and bank accounts. Eventually, Alibaba started to attract members from all over the world. In 1999, they raised $5 million from Goldman Sachs and $20 million from SoftBank. But they weren't profitable in the first three years. They expanded too fast and almost imploded when the dot-com bubble burst. They were on the brink of bankruptcy and only had enough cash to survive for 18 months. I call Alibaba 1001 mistakes. We had a lot of free members using our site and we didn't know how we'd make money. So we developed a product for Chinese exporters to meet US buyers online. This model saved us. By the end of 2002, we made a dollar in profits. Each year, we improved. In 2003, Jack faced another hurdle. eBay launched in China. Alibaba was still a young company at the time, being only four years old. And yet Jack wanted to create a sister site to compete with them. Even though Alibaba offered different services, Jack was convinced that eBay would come after their wholesalers. His team always believed in him, but this time they were doubtful. One day, Jack rallied his team in one room and asked them to stand against the wall. Afterwards, he told them to stand on their head. They were hesitant, but Jack said they had no excuse. He was the oldest among the group and could do it himself. One by one, they all managed to stand on their heads. Jack told them, when you stand upside down, you'll see the world from a different perspective. You see, you can do things that you have never done before. To compete with eBay, Jack secretly built a consumer auction site called Taobao, meaning searching for treasure. I pulled together six people in my office. I told them that I had a secret project for them. If they were interested in finding out what the job was, they would have to first resign from Alibaba and then move to work from a secret location. They couldn't tell their friends or family what they were working on. They couldn't even tell anyone at Alibaba what they were working on. In his old home, a three-room apartment, Jack and his team built Taobao and launched in 2003. They offered free listing, longer listing periods, and an instant communication tool to help buyers and sellers interact. It quickly became popular and encouraged many to switch from eBay. In 2005, the battle between eBay and Taobao shifted to one of China's biggest e-commerce issues, the payment system. Most people in China did not have credit cards, so business transactions were done in cash or through wire transfers. Knowing this, Jack launched an online escrow payment system called Alipay. The system held its users' money in escrow until products were delivered by sellers, ensuring that goods were received and payments were made. After noticing Taobao's growth, eBay offered to purchase the company. Jack rejected their offer and made a historic deal with Yahoo instead. Yahoo invested $1 billion in exchange for 40% stake in Alibaba. By 2006, eBay announced it was closing its site in China. Jack finally overcame one of his biggest hurdles. Years later, Jack revealed, My father said, if you were born 30 years ago, you'd probably be in a prison because the ideas you have are so dangerous. In 2014, Jack decided it was time to take Alibaba public. At the time, the company had over 200 million active buyers. Jack wanted to list with the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, but they rejected him. So he filed with the New York Stock Exchange instead. That move ended up helping Alibaba become even more successful. They became the largest IPO in US history at $25 billion. In a letter to employees, Jack wrote, 
We know well we haven't survived because our strategies are far-sighted and brilliant, or because our execution is too perfect, but because for 15 years we have preserved in our mission of making it easier to do business across the world, because we have insisted on a customer-first value system, because we have persisted in believing in the future, and because we have insisted that normal people can do extraordinary things. Just five years after the IPO, Amazon admitted to being defeated by Alibaba. The company struggled to compete with Alibaba's low, often free shipping, which didn't require users to meet any minimum orders. In an announcement to sellers, Amazon wrote they were shutting down its Chinese domestic e-commerce business. In other words, they would no longer compete with the massive e-commerce giants of China like Alibaba. This is the story of how it all began with the website that changed the face of global business. For more inspiring stories and advice from today's most successful leaders, don't forget to subscribe to our channel.